Hello, my name is Ana Castro, and I'm going to present blockage of interleukin 2 signaling at birth increases bacterial diversity of interest. So, cells in the mucosal lining have a function to monitoring the intestinal content of those, uh, the intestinal content. Since the small intestine is heavily colonized by microbes, there are cells like the M cells that are able to sample the microbes and deliver them to the lymphocytes in the pear patches. The lymphocytes in the pear patches are able to decide what reaction they're going to take. So if the microbe is a pathogen, they're going to elicit an immune response. And if the microbe is a uh, mutualistic bacteria, it's going to elicit a response of tolerance. There's a balance between the tolerance and the immune responsiveness. If this balance is lost, this is going to affect the bacterial community of the intestine. And diseases like um, inflammatory bowel syndrome, obesity, and type 2 diabetes can occur. So as I mentioned before, the lymphocyte in the pear patches, it starts as a naive cell. And in the presence of bacterial antigen, it can either react and differentiate into a T effector cell or a T regulatory cell. If it differentiates into an effective cell, it would elicit the immune response. And if it's a regulatory, differentiate into a regulatory cell, it will elicit the tolerance response that it could be an anti-inflammatory or just to slow down the immune response. So the naive G cell, the lymphocyte, has an interleukin-2 receptor. And in the presence of a cytokine interleukin-2, um, this will promote the differentiation of T-Rex cells. So when this receptor gets blocked, the whole pathway gets blocked, and the lymphocytes cannot react, cannot differentiate into two regs. And since they cannot differentiate into two reg cells, the tolerance response cannot occur. The receptor was blocked with an antibody called anti-CD25. This antibody is specific for one of the subunits in the receptor. And so what we want to know is, does blocking interleukin-2 signaling during the perinatal period affects the establishment of the mucosal tolerance? When we say perinatal period, we mean the first 20 days from birth. So the method used for this, we injected mice when they were pregnant or the newborns with anti 25 This would block the interleukin-2 signaling that we mentioned before. The pregnant lungs were injected because the antibody has proven that can cross, can cross the placenta and reach the newborn. So if it can reach the newborn, we expect that the interleukin-2 blockage is going to cure from the pup it's born. So we had four different treatment groups in the experiment. We had the control group, where the mom and the pup were injected, but they were not injected with anti 25 They were injected with a control antibody. In, that was non-relevant. We used, uh, it was rat anti-mouse IgG, and interleukin-2 was not blocked. Then the prenatal group, where the mom and the pup were injected, and they were injected with, uh, the mom was injected with anti 25 and the pup was injected with a non-relevant antibody. And the blockage of interleukin-2 occurs from day zero to day three. Then the postnatal group, where the pup was the one injected and the blockage only occurred from day 3 to day 20. And finally, the perinatal group, where the mom and the pup were injected, and the blockage occurred from day 0 to day 20. So we collected the samples when the mice were four weeks old. The sample that we collected was the intestinal lumen. We flashed it, and then we analyzed it using a molecular technique called ribosomal, ribosomal intergenic spacer analysis. This molecular technique consisted on extracting the DNA from the sample. So we extracted the DNA from the samples, and we wanted to make sure from that point that all the bacterial DNA was, that all the DNA obtained was bacterial DNA. So we quantified just to know the composition of the bacterial DNA obtained. After we had the, PCR, uh, the DNA, we amplify using PCR of the um, ribosomal uh, RNA region between the 16S and the 23S region. So this region is called the intergenic spacer region and it's different in every organism. The length is going to be different. So when we run a gel, the size of every band is going to tell us that it's a different organism. So this is the 
result of the gel that I obtained when I ran my samples. As we can see, the banding pattern is really different within the groups, but also especially between the groups. Um, we can see the control here, the prenatal that was one interleukin-2 was blocked from the 0 to the 3, the postnatal, and the prenatal group when it was perinatal group when it was blocked from the 0 to the 10. So something that we can say from this is that the small intestine bacterial community diversity varies greatly between animals, since each of the well is one mice, one sample. Also from this gel, we can say that the, that is specific for bacterial DNA only. We run one sample, a control sample, that contain only mouse DNA. Since we didn't obtain any bands, we can say that it's only specific for bacterial DNA and it's not affected by mouse DNA. We analyzed that gel using a software that counts the bands of every treatment. We use a software in instead of counting by ourselves because it eliminates the bias. So each of the dots, it's one sample, and the orange dot is the median. From this, we can see that the prenatal and perinatal group seems to have the higher number of bacteria, like diversity in bacteria, since there's a higher number of bands. And the postnatal group has a lower number of bacterial diversity. We run a statistic analysis, and we find out that the only group that is significantly different from the control is the perinatal group. Therefore, we can say that the blockage of in, uh, interleukin-2 signaling through the perinatal period from day zero to day 20 increases the bacterial diversity. Okay, then, as you can see in this graph, the bacterial DNA concentration varies from 0.6 nanogram per milliliter to 14, almost 15 nanogram per milliliter. That means a great range of the bacterial DNA concentration. But even though this happened, the, we were able to use it for the assay. So we can say that the RISA, the assay that we used, is useful across the range of bacterial DNA concentrations. So also in this graph, we compare the number of bands with the bacterial DNA concentration. When we, when we did this, we found a weak correlation between both. So the fact that there's a weak correlation tells us that the bacterial DNA concentration has little effect on the number of bands that we obtain. So that was not a reason why we obtain more bands in one group or one sample more than the other one. So in conclusion, we found out that the group that is more affected is when interleukin-2 is blocked through the prenatal period. But the fact that we found that the prenatal period also has a great effect in the postnatal group, it's not even like the bacterial diversity of the postnatal group is even lower than the control group, that tells us that the effect of the perinatal period comes mostly from the blockage of interleukin-2 through day zero to day three. I wanna thank you, Dr. Brunet, Caitlin Gifton, his son, that was the one that helps collecting the samples, and Cambry for the financial support in my research. We got time for questions. Yeah, very well done. Thank you very much. And I have one question. So, do you think that you, you add like anti C25, right? Mm -hmm. Is it any other uh, consequence for adding this kind of antibody in addition to blocking the I, I, I mean, it's a specific for one of the subunits in the receptor. And in the lab that we work, they have been working with anti C25, and it has been proven to block efficiently. So it doesn't have any other like blocking other molecules. I mean, all. there must be other molecules too, because it only blocks one of the subunits. There's three subunits in the receptor, so you can block any other, and it's gonna also, it will not allow the interleukin to to bind the receptor since one of the subunits is blocked. So, uh, in general, would you say that increased bacterial diversity in the gut is a good thing or a bad thing, and and if so, how does this affect on this perinatal blockage? Would you suggest doing that if it's or not? <laughs> I mean, it could. I think it's important, but I mean, the fact that um, yeah, okay, the blockage um, changes the bacterial diversity. 
So changes in the bacterial diversity can cause the, the other diseases. So that's how we can cut diseases like I mentioned in this power, the inflammatory bowel syndrome, like even diabetes, even Alzheimer's. There's a lot of diseases that have been associated with changes in the bacterial community. But and you're showing an increased diversity. Increased diversity. With with so blockage, blockage in the perinatal blockage cured, period. Oh, cured. That means that the tolerance is like disrupted. Okay, got it. Yeah. Anything else? So, what is the, uh, the 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 limitation of the research technique is that we, you can't get identities, yeah. right? You can just know just based on the size, and you're only getting like Dr. Sobieski asked yesterday. You, you're only getting a few bands. You're only getting, you know, at most maybe a dozen a dozen different bands. So, is that is that the only? Are there there's certainly more than a dozen bacteria in the that does the different types of bacteria. So you might say what you're doing to try to address identities and actual numbers. Um, actually sequencing all the data and this does say it works but it's not very sensitive. And then also since a lot of the bacteria could be similar, maybe we we're not identifying those things. So the sequencing would allow us to have a more like accurate and more sensitive assay to know what is exactly in a gut. So with this assay you're only getting at best the, the, the 12 most prevalent bacteria. But right. the other one that we're running we're getting like the number with like 250,000 <coughs> reads I think. Yeah, 200, quarter of a million reads quarter of a per million mouse. Reads. Yeah. So that would allow us to know a lot more about the actual composition of the gut. Question here, but this is off topic. I apologize, but I heard a presentation at an honors conference a couple of weeks ago where the student made the case that bacteria in the gut has a big impact on obesity. Yeah, and for I For example, so it isn't just the calories in, calories out stuff, it's what's going on in there. What, I mean, are, are there, you have thoughts about how, how we take that in our personal lives and, and, and use it to be healthier? I mean, I think they haven't identified exactly what bacteria is the one that affects. I don't know if I put it now. Okay. Um, the, exactly which are the bacteria that affect that. But in personal life, I mean, I think it's just you are predisposed to have yeah. certain things. Yeah. And maybe if we can like do more research on that, there could be a way that it could be. And if they figure out what bacteria are the ones that are causing those things. They so, could find a way to manipulate it and maybe help the people that have those, those diseases. So what I got from this was this whole rise in metabolic diseases is a lot more complicated yeah. than, than people think. Okay, thank you. Good morning, my name is Becky Williams and today I will be discussing two anthropologists, Ruth Benedict and Margaret Mead. So to understand the story of Ruth Benedict and Margaret Mead and their works, you first have to understand their main mentor and teacher and that was Franz Boas and he is known as the father of American anthropology. And during his time, he largely disagreed with the fact that culture was the result of biology. And said he proposed that culture was actually the result of social interaction, daily interaction between people. He uh, disagreed with, the, uh, with his times in that culture was the rigid result from evolutionary theory. Although he had the premise that culture was the result of social interaction, he did advocate scientific and methodological approaches such as direct field work, and also he advocated the inductive approach in that he believed researchers should gather data and continue and gather data until they could support a substantial theory. And he also promoted cultural relativism, and that is a term meaning um, that one would observe and understand a culture through the values of that culture rather through the, uh, through the biased beliefs and values of your own culture. So the commonalities between these two women, they were both trained by Boaz at Columbia University, and this was due to Boaz's opinion that in the field of anthropology needed more female um, opinion and views because it was male-dominated at the time. They were both influenced by just adult psychology and area in psychology at the time that focused on studying holes rather than parts of the holes. 
They were both strong forces in their field, both in research and in the writings that they produced. They upheld the configuration approach, and with this approach they proposed that cultures had larger characteristics making up that culture, and then that those characteristics of the larger culture then influenced the individual characteristics of the people making up the culture. And going along with that thought, they believe there is a strong intertwining relationship between culture and personality. Ruth Benedict, her early life was unfortunately um, filled with distraught. Her father died when she was very young, and her mother was raising her and her younger sister as a depressed single parent. And this led to depression throughout Ruth Benedict's life as well. She was very shy, very quiet. And later on, when she was married, she was unable to have children, which greatly affected her life. But she found comfort when she went to study at Columbia University with Franz Boas. And she, he even became a father figure to her for the father that she never grew up with, and she called him Papa Franz. And with his um, push to do field work, she ended up studying directly <coughs> in, uh, with Native American groups. And that study of those Native American groups brought her to her very famous notion that culture is personality writ large. Ruth Benedict studied four Native American groups, and her goal was to study, again, the overall personality of the culture and see how that personality of the culture affected the individuals within the culture. And it became her uh, famous work, Patterns of Culture. One of the groups she studied was the Pueblo Indians of New Mexico, and she found that they had a very um, collective personality as a culture. The Plains Indians were concerned with fearlessness and power. They wanted to be supreme, be on top. The Dobu Islanders of Melanesia were very distrusting. They felt that the gain of one meant the deceitful loss of another of their society. And the Crocodile Indians of Northwest America, they were obsessed with wealth and excess, so they were more obsessed with material things. And her conclusion from studying these four very distinct groups was that the individuals found between the groups were very different in their personalities, and she believed it was a result as the overall culture. She also worked closely with the Office of War Information of the United States during World War II, and it resulted in her work the chrysanthemum and the sword. And in this work, she explored the European and Asian countries who were the enemies during World War II, especially the Japanese culture. <coughs> and this led her to the national character approach in which she studied the characteristics of a whole nation of peoples. <coughs> there was criticism of her work, of course. She was praised for noticing differences between cultures. But she was also criticized for not providing next steps in celebrating the differences that she found. Many um, argued that she simply was stereotyping cultures rather than truly pointing out characteristics of the cultures, and that she was too humanistic and did not have enough quantitative data to back up her theories, and said it was based all on observation. And um, as Americans value individuality, they felt that she wasn't focusing on the individual enough and they didn't appreciate her studying on such a broad perspective. Margaret Mead, not only was she a student of Franz Boas, but also of Ruth Benedict, and that led to a great friendship between the women throughout their lives. She also studied um, and provided cross-cultural research and contributed to the configuration approach. She specifically, however, set out to study adolescence and the enculturation of adolescence or the upbringing of adolescence. It was believed during her time in America that adolescents had very uncontrolled emotions, and Americans contributed those emotions to biology rather than to culture. And being a student of Franz Boas and Ruth Benedict, she wanted to contend that, and she believed that it was actually culture that contributed to their uncontrolled emotions. So she went to Samoa in 1925 and studied Samoan culture, and she realized that the family structure in Samoa was very different from that in America. It was very relaxed, and the sexual relationships in Samoa were very relaxed, therefore resulting in very relaxed and independent um, adolescence. Whereas in America, where the 
sexual behavior and family structures were very rigid, that's what she believed um, contributed to adolescents' high emotion. And so this work led her to study gender roles. She <coughs> had the question, if culture seemed to determine the adolescent's mood, then are the roles that men and women partake in um, in different societies also um, part of culture? So she studied three societies in New Guinea. She studied the Arapesh, and uh, both men and women had gender roles that seemed very feminine, very caring, very nurturing. The Chambuli, the men were feminine and caring, and the women were more masculine and aggressive, very much the opposite of our culture here in Western areas. And then the Mandogamor, both men and women were very masculine and aggressive and seemed to not be as fostering and caring towards their children. And this led her to the conclusion that enculturation and attributing meaning to our biological sex then creates gender roles in different societies, and those gender roles then determine the individual temperament of people found in different societies. <coughs> Margaret Mead was seen as a functionalist, a function. Um, she saw gender as a function. She did argue that gender roles provided structure, and gender roles would be more beneficial if only there was standardization across cultures of gender roles. But she did also mention that standardization would mean the loss of natural talents and individual natural abilities. She also was seen as a feminist, as she believed in equality of men and women, regardless of the gender roles set up by cultural means. And she also believed that societies should strive to appreciate individual uniqueness. Criticism of Margaret Mead mainly came from her work in Samoa. They felt that she did little research before going to Samoa, and that she didn't um, practice the language, know it well enough before going, and that she did not live directly in the villages with the Samoan people, and that she also had two small samples to base her theories off of. They also believed, just like Ruth Benedict, that Margaret Mead might not have had enough quantitative data to support her theories and only relied on observation. And as far as feminism, she was criticized by minority women, <coughs> focusing on white and middle-aged women, and also ignoring the inequalities of wealth and racism. Again, the similarities between the women, they both very strongly uh, advocated cultural relativism and that they emerged themselves in the culture and tried to understand the culture from that culture's belief systems. They also practiced field studies throughout their life and valued that direct contact. They upheld and supported the configuration approach that was inspired by just felt psychology, that the whole personality and characteristics of different cultures then influenced the individual personality characteristics of people found within those cultures. Benedict studied the larger effects of culture on personality, while Margaret Mead focused specifically on the upbringing of adolescents, as well as the relationship between sex and gender roles. Both women believed that culture resulted in individual differences rather than biology, and that anthropology should be a field of understanding and learning about differences around the world in different cultures. And they both supported the flourishing field in culture and personality that now is known as psychological anthropology. I would like to thank Dr. Kamara for being my mentor and instructor. And I'd like to thank all of you for attending. Do you have any questions? I have a couple of questions. Yeah. Okay, so both of your, both, both of the people that you refer to here really believe in the importance of cultural relativism. It's my question, it's kind of personal here, because I, I really understand that. Going to a culture, understanding them on their terms, not being judgmental and arrogant. Uh, and on the other hand, I'm also, so I'm preparing to go to Africa, and we're really trying to do that. On the other hand, I'm also studying another group called the, the Islamic State, and my cultural relativism doesn't go very far with, with, with this group. So, I mean, what would they say about something like universal human rights, where, where maybe at a global point of view, somebody has to decide this is right and this is wrong, and, and, and 
your cultural relativism here, maybe it's involving penal genital mutilation, maybe it's involving some other form of violence or something like that, where we would say, this as a global community we simply can't tolerate. What would your two authors say about that? Do you have any idea? I believe that they would, um, they would not um, be completely strict in their idea of cultural relativism, that they would see that there is a point where it okay. becomes serious and it's an endangerment to people's well-being. I think they were more, especially during their time, um, more concerned with just accepting other cultures and learning about them in a time when, when wars were going on, it was just more of hating the other culture rather than really learning about the differences in genders and the different roles that we have in, in our families and daily lives. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and then I, I do have one more question, but I don't want to. Anyone else has? We have plenty of time. Okay, so, uh, so then, oh gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking. Oh yeah, my, uh, yeah, the, the idea that of culture as opposed to biology, and you know, since, and I, it was, reminds me me back in the early days when when some of my professors said the human being is a blank slate and culture writes on it and it makes you what you are, and biology and genes are are not important. You know, since then. And, and even at that time, there's quite a, 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 a broad science showing that that's not true, that, that we can't just dismiss genetic biological factors in terms of human behavior. What, what, what do you think the two women would say about things we've learned since then that would, I mean, would it temper their view that culture is everything and, and genetics are nothing, do you think? I think so. These women were very open, and I feel like they were very willing to listen to other viewpoints. I feel if, if they knew um, the biological advances that we had made, they would still argue that culture has a greater, larger effect, but they might also um, realize that biology does make a difference in our personalities as well. It's yeah. not just simply strictly culture. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so the first, the first uh, anthropologist that you talked about, you said that um, so, so she went to these to these different uh, native groups and, and sort of classified the group as a as a cultural personality, right. and then she was criticized for stereotyping. Mm -hmm. So I was just curious how how can you describe a cultural personality without being accused of stereotyping? Is there and and that's exactly what I was talking to my mentor, Dr. Kamar, about when I had written this paper is. Um, it's, it's kind of sad to think that she was criticized for stereotyping because she honestly was just trying to view this culture and the characteristics that surrounded the culture. And um, I know I read um, that she did not intend to stereotype at all. I think people just don't see past that, and a lot of times they look for where criticism can be made, and I feel like that's where they went because it just seemed like stereotyping, and they might not have directly looked at all of her work and all of the work she's done directly with them. Yeah, you also said something about the criticism for lack of quantitative data. So really, I was also, I was curious, if, is there a certain technique, field technique for anthropologists that protects you from the criticism of stereotyping? And you know, I don't know, actually, that's a good question. I don't know specifically what quantitative data they were looking for. It would be very hard, especially dealing with personality, to make that quantitative. So that's a great question. I'll have to think about I don't know if there's an answer to this, but one of the things that, <clears throat> to me, seem to be missing, and it's not meant to be a criticism, is the mm -hmm. influence of technology. Because uh, in the last 20 or 30 years, I think some of us with gray hair and other things have witnessed a major change in, in cultural issues with the advent of technology. Mm -hmm. and, and, and again, I think it's just something to to, uh, it, it's an additional uh, frosting on all of this, and how that, how, how predictions could be made, for example. Very much. <coughs> so as Dr. Burnett just said, my name's Kitty, and that's the title of my presentation. So, kind of a little layout of how our talk's going to go today. Um, we're going to go through an introduction on kind of why we started this pro project, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the disease chytrid, and then we're going to go through some methods and strategies, how we gained all of our data and how we anal analyzed it. And then we'll go through some results and sequence finding. And then at the very end, we'll talk a little bit about future directions or where this information that we've gathered could go. So um, one of the main reasons that we thought this, this project was very interesting is 
um, known to be from this disease called chytridical mycosis. And how chytrid works, it's a fungus, that very first one, word up there, that's our fungus that causes chytrid. And how it works is the chytrid swims in the water, it lives in the water. The amphibians will obviously go in the water, that's where they live. Um, and then the chytrid can get into their skin, it develops forming spores, and as those spores leave, it kills the frog or the salamander. And they've done a lot of research on this disease as it has contributed to about 200 species extinctions, but there's no real known cause to why the chytrid is killing the animals. They're not sure how that expulsion of the spores is causing them to die. Um, until they die, there's really no symptoms that they have the disease. All of a sudden, there's just a large population deceased in that area. So, uh, with the research that's been going on, they found a bacteria called J. lividum, and sometimes when that bacteria lives innately in the microbiomes of the amphibians, it can protect them from chytrid. It produces the substance called violacin, see it right there, and the violacin in some manner protects the frogs from the chytrid killing them. Um, so in our research, we wanted to see potentially if we could find some microbes that might also be known to help save the frogs from chytrid. <coughs> Um, some difficulties that come with that is that with different species, different microbes are helpful and different ones are harmful. So the J. lividum has been seen to help some frogs, but actually danger some salamanders. So it makes them more vulnerable to the disease. Um, and then with reintroduction, changing the probiotic microbes of these frogs and then releasing them back into the lake could cause mass chaos for the other animals that live in that lake can mess up with their skin microbes, if they're eating fish or something that lives in that lake, can mess up their microbiome. So there's a big danger of trying to find the balance between saving the frogs and harming the other animals that live there as well. So with our project, our main goal originally was to collect the skin microbiomes off the tadpoles and then compare it to what the skin microbiomes were on the frogs. Sadly, we didn't realize that it takes a little bit longer for frogs to metamorph than we thought. So we decided to change our project to compare the microbiome on the tadpoles to the microbiome of the water and soil that the tadpoles lived in. So our first procedure is we found this in another paper that had sampled the diversity of amphibian skin. We take sterile swabs, we rinse the tadpoles with 100 microliters of sterile water, and then we'd swab them down, all the way from their heads to their tails, twice on the top, twice on the sides, twice on the back, to really make sure we got their whole skin microbiome. And then from there, we collected those samples. We also collected some environmental soil, water, and the water they were living in while they were in our lab. So the first thing we did is we amplified our, we went to amplify the partial 16S DNA. We used Illumina primers. Um, we decided to go with the 16S because that's a conserved sequence in all bacteria, so all bacteria should show up so we could get a big diversity, and it won't, the 16S section won't collect the tadpoles DNA, it won't collect plant DNA or anything like that. So, after we did our um, PCR with those primers, we quantified in our data on the nanodrop, saw that we did have some DNA according to the nanodrop, and then we ran our through the thermo thermocycler and loaded it into a gel, and this is what our first four gels looked like. For any of you guys who aren't familiar with running PCR gels, they're supposed to have bands on them. So we tried this four times, trying different things, making sure we switched kits once, we made sure we had Dr. Field stare at us while we did it, we made sure that we were doing the procedure correctly, and something <coughs> was inhibiting our PCR because we weren't getting any bands on our gel. And when you run a gel like this, the PCR product should be amplified. You should have enough of it that it shows up as a band on the gel. So from there, we switched primers, and we decided to do a whole 16S amplification. So we used these AF and 1492 primers. We also, first gel of that turned up blank as well. So we brainstormed again, and we started to centrifuge our Q-tips, thinking that maybe the DNA was trapped in the Q-tip and wasn't coming out with our resuspension buffer. The first time we did that, we also switched using a new TAC, so TAC is the molecule that goes through and does the PCR. We switched from using hot start TAC to normal TAC in hopes that that would make a difference. <coughs> Our very first gel of that did produce results, but they were the incorrect size. So we did it one more time. Um, so for our seventh time, we still used the new TAC, and this is what our gel looked like right here. So we did get three good bands. Sadly, these are not our tadpole bands. 
So we still do not have any DNA that we collected off of our tadpoles that amplified through PCR. Um, our conclusion from this is that something in the tadpole skin that we collected is inhibiting our PCR. Um, through other papers, we had read that there's other techniques and other primers that work better for amphibian skin. So we would probably want to try that when we continue this project. But we did get some DNA back from our water and our soil. So for our next step, we went through and transformed our DNA that we had from PCR into competent E. coli cells. Um, so we did our water, our two water samples and our soil sample. And just to make sure we didn't have anything, we took our mis-sized tadpole pr products and we put those into competent cells as well, just in case we got something. From there, we ran colony PCR. So we took our five largest colonies that were isolated on our plates and ran them through their own PCR, put those out on a gel, and this is what we got. So our waters did amplify DNA, so our water samples did get taken up into the plasmid and then put through onto the plate and grew. Um, surprisingly, our soil did not, and less surprisingly, neither did our tadpoles. So we went through and did do sequence analysis for our two water samples in hopes that we could potentially draw conclusions between what was in their environmental water and what was in their lab water. So here's kind of what our sequence analysis looks like. Um, after we used Sanger sequencing, this is what we came back with. So this is an example of what a fast A sequence would look like right here. From here, we put this sequence into a program called BLAST. And what BLAST does is it compares your sequence that you put in with every other sequence that other people have put in and saved and identified. So how it kind of comes back is it comes back as a list of hits, things that it matches. So our top hits were what we assumed or could generally conclude that's what our sample was. So these water one through A through E, this was their environmental water and this was the water they were living in in the lab. So our first four here all came back as uncultured bacteria. Someone else put that system in blast, they didn't quite know what it was, came back, they still didn't quite know what it was. So we compared those <laughs> And if you look at these little symbols, these two, B and C, they came back with the same top hit, which means they're most likely the same bacterium. And then A and D came back similar. So their top hits were very similar to each other. So we've concluded that we most likely have three different things in water one. And then in water two, we also had three different things because water two B and water two E were just the E. coli plasmids closing back up on themselves. They didn't take in any of our DNA. So if you look back at our gel, that's why these bands are lower. There's no real band there because they didn't take much in. So after we did all of that, I took these sequences that we had right here, put them into a different program that's called Clustal Omega. And what that program does is it compares the sequences to each other to try to draw comparisons between them and maybe see what they could be related how different they are from each other. So this first tree, um, just to note, these aren't like exact distances. This is a relative distance, so you can't really draw many conclusions on how far apart or close together they are. This first tree kind of shows that the majority of our water ones clustered together, which means water ones are most likely the same. The only water one that didn't cluster with the others was the one that came back as that methanobacterium. So according to our tree, you can see that some of our ones that they said were the same right here came back relatively different. So that could be as simple as a difference in a few end tail amino acids because all of our sequences were not the exact same length. So if we were to trim them all to the same length, we could most likely get some better results. But due to the timing at the end of the semester, we just didn't quite have the ability to do that yet. And then <coughs> we took our sequences and mixed them in with a bunch of known 16S sequences. So these are 16S sequences of a whole bunch of other bacteria of different varieties. We have some gram-positive, some gram-negative. Um, these are really common gut bacteria. So as you can see, our bacteria is right here, all clustered with each other. And then they clustered up here with some gut bacteria. So our conclusion that we drew from this was that our bacteria that we sampled are most likely fecal contaminants of the water where the tadpoles were living. So that was the best conclusion we can make, but we had such a limited data set, and we only got samples back for unknown bacteria from five water samples <coughs> on two different types. There wasn't a whole bunch others we could do, 
But it was interesting to see that they all did cluster together rather than being spread out around this tree as what we originally suspected. And then some future experiments, um, you guys can look through these. Some things that we could see our research going, but our first step would be to actually start over at the beginning and re-swab our tadpoles and really follow one of those other procedures to figure out why our PCR wasn't working. Because without our PCR, we weren't able to send off with the alumina that we would have liked to do originally, which would have come back, as Anna said, with hopefully a quarter of a million hits. So we would have really been able to sample all of the bacteria that was living on the tadpoles and then compare it to all the bacteria that was in the water and maybe draw some conclusions on what they were there, why they were there, and then even after that, look for the commensal relationships that could potentially save the frogs. So, um, overall, it was a project that we all really enjoyed. We learned a lot about persevering, keep going, and trying new things, and being creative thinkers. So, definitely something we enjoyed, but hopefully this ex project can be taken up after this semester, and we can try to get some more interesting results and draw some better conclusions about what lives on the skin of temples. And there's some sources for you guys. A couple comments on your uh, your comment about perhaps the swabbing was somehow inhibitory in your first mm -hmm. PCR. And just as a comparison, I know that certain bacteria are sensitive to cotton swabs, and you must use Dacron swabs because the cotton has enough inhibitors that will in inhibit then any further growth. I think gonorrhea is the example bacteria. Secondly, ironically, just about two weeks ago, I was jumping around telling a few people there, one of the difficulties with studying this disease in frogs is the generation times. It takes a long time to get enough tadpoles. It, it, it was reported in one of the Nature journals uh, a few weeks ago that zebrafish larvae can be infected with this. And they were taunting this as a new model system to actually study what's going on in an animal. Because by the time we see the frogs, or, I mean, like, by comparison, you can get 50 generations of zebrafish in about two months, whereas with frogs, it's, it's a much longer period of time. That's very interesting. So, you didn't get any, uh, any transformants when you used 16S uh, genes derived from the soil, okay. right? But you did, you did amplify 16S from soil. But, so, did you, have you put any thought into explaining Maybe why, I mean, it makes sense why you didn't get it in tadpoles, because you didn't have any 16S, mm -hmm. but, but why not any in the, in the uh, soil? The only thing that we did different between the soil and the water samples is the soil, we used the soil extraction kit, and for our water samples, we used a different kit. So maybe potentially that could have caused a difference. Um, <coughs> when we were doing our competent cells while they were in their incubation period, um, our ice bucket actually fell on the floor and they all fell down, so we could have damaged our cells at that point and our competent cells could have been sensitively disrupted and um, some of ours, we had to collect them all and put them back so some of them were on the floor longer than others, so maybe our soil one was one of the ones that sat outside of the ice a little bit too long. So it random. Yeah, it could just be random. We haven't really thought a whole bunch about why it didn't work. We're actually kind of used to not getting results. So we kind of accepted it and said if we went through and did it again, we would do something differently with, that, with the soil as well. Good morning. So this presentation that I'm about to give to you um, is a nice summation of the research I collected this summer and throughout the school year with my clarinet professor and mentor, Dr. Don McConkie who is actually unable to be here today. She's judging the All-State Solo and Small Ensemble competition in Missouri at Mizzou. So let's get started. So first of all, um, it's good for a person to have a nice idea of the history of the clarinet and to understand that the clarinet is a relatively new instrument to the um, access of musicians. So. I'm going to briefly touch up on that history. So the clarinet was first uh, originated in around 1690. It was this instrument called the shawamo, which was a long kind of pipe-like um, instrument that was used to impersonate the sound of a hunting call. Um, back then, orchestras uh, were during the Baroque period of music, and so um, brass <coughs> instruments played a really key part in fanfares and impersonating that kind of like hunting call sound, and so um, 
woodwind uh, players were like, hmm, how can we impersonate this? And so the Shalimar was invented. And then at the um, middle of the 18th century, a man by the name of Johann Christoph Denner um, decided to make adaptations to this instrument, and he um, added the speaker key, which allowed for the use of an additional octave, and um, extended the range to about two octaves. But this posed a problem, because of the lack of keys on the instrument, only a few um, keys could be played in. So there were only about four keys that the instrument was able to play in, and so it really limited the use of it in the orchestral setting. So then Ivan Mueller added keys and in turn um, dissipated this problem. And by this time, it was about um, 1820, and orchestras were finally um, accessing the instrument. So Closé and Bame teamed up, and um, Closé was a famous clarinet prodigy of the time in Western Europe. And he wanted to improve the instrument so that it could really become a staple part of the orchestra and a really flexible um, instrument as a solo uh, setting. And so uh, he used Bame's system for the flute that Bame had developed and applied it to the clarinet. And thus, by 1850, the modern system was created. So my project uh, that I did I analyzed 10 different pieces, and um, I analyzed the technical aspects of the instrument, the clarinet itself, and how that was reflected in the literature written of what I analyzed, which I will explain later. But before I uh, get to that part of my presentation, I would like to touch on some of the 20th century adaptations to the clarinet, and, how, and then I will go back and reflect upon how they uh, were reflected in the literature that I analyzed. So, talking about the um, 1800s and the modern clarinet, these three adaptations were very, very important, and my clarinet professor and I um, were able to find many different examples of these adaptations being useful in the literature that we uh, looked at. So, Oscar Euler, uh, in about 1920, he took the clarinet and he made some major changes to it, he um, did some rearranging of the keys, and he added a few keys so that the acoustical quality of the instrument was much clearer, and the instrument was much easier to keep in tune. And then in 1952, um, the SK mechanism was invented, and it resulted in even better tuning improvements around what is called the throat tone range of the instrument, which is most typically fuzzy and really, really hard to play clearly. So that was a very, very big part of the clarinet world. And then finally, Buffet, which is one of the leading um, clarinet producers in the world, it's a French company, they created the Festival line of clarinets, which had this uh, alternate E flat key, which in one of my pieces by Message A is essential because there's this really, really hard run, and um, the clarinet has two sets of keys on either side, um, and going back and forth um, is really important in the clarity of the run. But without that E flat key, you have to slide your pinky, and it's really, really hard to do smoothly, and so it's, it's pretty noticeable. And so <laughs> that one extra key makes that entire passage just so much prettier. So, All right, now to talk about my uh, project. So the clarinet evolution was really, really important to uh, what we analyzed. And in this picture, I just have a nice little diagram of the, um, the evolution of the clarinet. And so um, at the end is the final uh, Euler um, model, which is uh, what I play on. Um, and then towards the middle is the clarinet that Ivan Mueller adapted. And then there's a couple others that I didn't mention, but we mentioned in our paper. OK. so. The Solo des Concours is a competition that the Paris Conservatory has been holding since 1824. And essentially what it is, is um, it's a conservatory, and so students just focus on their instrument. And so clarinet students every year, um, their goal before they graduate is to win the Concours competition, because for the history of this competition, the winners have gone on to have really successful careers as composers and clarinetists. 
And so every year a piece is commissioned and all of the clarinet students have 30 days to learn and memorize the piece. And then they, their task is to perform it in front of a jury of professors of the conservatory and then also the composer of the piece. And so essentially what my clarinet professor and I did, we recognized last year um, that a lot of the repertoire I was playing had a history of being composed for this competition. And so we got to thinking, um, I wonder how this ties in to the evolution of the clarinet and how like some of the modern 20th century literature that has some really new abstract um, technical demands how that differs and how um, the like the simplicity of the instrument evolved and so we looked at 10 different scores um, ranging from 1899 to 1952 in composition dates and we assessed how um, as the pieces progressed in time how they changed and how the technical demands changed and then we looked at um, the evolution of the clarinet as these clarinetists were making adaptations to the instrument and how like in 1920 these different uh, tasks were possible and how they weren't possible in say 1899 when um, one of the first pieces we looked at was composed. So, uh, okay. so like I said we composed 10 pieces and we looked at the scores and then we assessed um, the technical demands and then we also assessed the history of the composer and then also the history of the winner of the competition that year. And our findings uh, were very clear. All 10 of the winners for the competition um, for these years, because it's been going on since 1824 annually, they all went on to very, very successful, prominent clarinet careers in Europe. And all 10 of these pieces are staple parts of the clarinet repertoire. And so as a clarinet performance major, um, as I go on, if I you know, go on to graduate school or what have you, or the rest of my undergrad um, education, all of these pieces will appear, and I will probably play all of them so this was a very, very good experience, not only learning about the history and um, looking at this unique perspective for why we study these pieces, but also just learning them as well. So in summation, um, our paper basically touched on these topics. So we looked at the lives and careers of the winners as well as the composers, and then we looked also at the clarinet faculty of the Paris Conservatory. We have a little portion of our paper where we, um, we kind of get on a tangent and we look at um, the faculty and uh, some of their contributions to the clarinet world and uh, the clarinet literature. And then we also analyzed the musical history of the pieces. And so obviously, like I mentioned before, depending on the time period of when these pieces uh, were composed, there were different trends in classical music. And so, you know, in the 1920s, Impressionism was a very, very huge part of the musical scene. And Debussy's Premier Rhapsody, uh, which was composed in 1910, it has very, very large impressionistic elements in it. And then finally, um, after um, gathering all this data, which we're still working on the final touches of our paper, and um, Dr. McConkey is a very, very prominent figure in the world of collegiate clarinet, and so she has many peers, um, such as the clarinet professor at the University of Kansas, the clarinet professor at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, um, the University of Miami, um, they are going to be looking at our paper and giving us feedback, and that's kind of our goal for the rest of this uh, school year and as we go throughout the summer. And then our end goal is to ultimately try to get kind of like a brief abstract of our findings published in the International Clarinet Association's uh, quarterly journal, The Clarinet. And if we're able to accomplish that, we will be able to die peacefully. So, anyway. That is the summation of my summer ESER project for 2016. Thank you. Are there any questions?
What's yes. the most interesting thing you found that you weren't like expecting to find? So, I had no idea who Euler was, and I thought, because I took clarinet pedagogy last spring, which is a class based all around um, like the history of the clarinet, and how to teach the clarinet, and why this is all important, and that's ultimately what inspired this. And so, um, I thought that after 1850, and uh, Closet and Bain teamed up with Buffet to make this uh, standardized clarinet, I thought that was it. And I was just like, oh. This was the clarinet. This is what we play on now. It's been around for 150 years. But there were a lot of really, really cool um, adaptations in like the early 20th century that also kind of went along with the jazz scene. And I thought that was really, really interesting to find. I found out a lot of things that I had no idea existed. And we got a look at some uh, older models of clarinets. She actually, Dr. McConkie, has some in her office. And so it was really cool for her to just <coughs> pull those over and show me things. and. I'm going to admit, I actually played on one when she wasn't in the room. <laughs> I took my mouthpiece and I just put it on there and it was actually kind of bit me because there was like dust all over and so just like blew it But anyway, yeah, I think that was the most interesting part of the process. So, oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh. So, so, I think one of the things that you pulled out was that with the, with the technology advances in the, in the clarinet that um, there are certain compositions that were that were created that could not be played on an older clarinet, right? Yes. Because of the you talked, you had some examples like that. Yeah. So I wondered if it if it is is there any examples where it goes the other way, whereas an old com a composition written a long time ago is actually easier to play on the older style clarinet. Is there any examples where it goes backwards? That's a really good question. Um, so, like I mentioned, um, the clarinet isn't a very old instrument, and so like in comparisons to like another woodwind, like the flute. The flute has been around for over a thousand years, and its origins are all the way back to like Central Asia. And so, um, you know, there's a lot more um, older history to that instrument than there is the clarinet. And it kind of just went from like zero to 100 really fast. Um, so, honestly, I'm not sure. Because all I've only played a couple um, compositions from like the 1700s and like with the shallow, that were written for like shallow clarinet, and really um, they're just really simplistic, and so there it's not really there aren't any really like musical demands that you can't play on like a modern day clarinet. But it, it, it might be hard to separate that from just the simplicity of the composition and, and the evolution of, of of how things were written. Yeah. Yeah. That. That's really true, um, and I think to, to further answer that question, I think one would have to do more investigation of like the original uh, origin of the clarinet. We kind of just recognized it, and then went on to like the first adaptation to get to where we are today. We didn't really look at like a lot of the inspiration for the clarinet, so that's a really good question. I'll have to ask her about that. <laughs> so. Yes. Clarinet, ordinarily you think of that with, with a band or an orchestra. Just in your own personal life, when you move on, is this something you can just play for enjoyment, like people do hard harmonicas and pianos, things like that? You know... Do people do that? Yeah, yeah totally. Um, I, I definitely know people who play in like the Emporia City Band and right. who have, you know, woodwind instruments like the clarinet that they played in like high school or college and they're now, you know, like... But do you need a band or an orchestra but, to play the clarinet? Um, I, no, I don't think so. Um, I mean, and that might be biased because I have such a good uh, exposure to the clarinet and what you can do with it. And someone who maybe just played in like high school band would be naive and think like, oh, I need to like play with a band. But I don't think so. Okay. It's a really versatile instrument. And so there's a lot you can do just to like sit and entertain yourself. Okay. <laughs> um, People do that with the piano all the time. Yeah. Thanks. Are there any more questions? No. no? Thanks, Gary. Okay. Thank you very much. So, good morning, everyone. So, I've done my research primarily with microRNA and trying to understand its therapeutic effect and mechanisms, specifically in melanoma cells. And I've worked with uh, Dr. Yan, who has been a, a really great uh, mentor and guide for this project. And specifically, we've been working on. Uh, microRNA 15A, so 
Just brief background on microRNA. It is a short non-coding RNA that is able to regulate protein expression post-transcription and pre-translationally. There's an RNA-induced sciencing complex with Argonaut 2, and it binds to a region of messenger RNA. And there are hundreds of microRNAs that regulate thousands of genes in the human body, and we can try to work with these to discover what microRNAs have effects that will therapeutically help cancer cells and stop some of these uh, cancer-progressing molecules. So what we did is we first started our study with a uh, in vitro analysis using an MTT assay, and we had so we had four different uh, cell lines down here, and three different experimental groups. We had a control, a negative control, and a microRNA 15A group for each of the cancer lines, and the control is just with the lipofectamine. So for all these studies, we used a cationic lipid to bring the microRNA through the membrane, and then for the negative control, we use the cationic lipid with a scramble microRNA, so it's just like microRNA, but it's a random sequence, so it shouldn't have any significant effect on the cells. And then we had our microRNA 15A. So in each group, you can see that the this is the relative viability, and so we use the um, control to normalize the viability, and we have microRNA 15A, was able to decrease that in all groups. We then went and did the same study uh, in vivo, so we used a mouse model, uh, and for this we used B16 mouse melanoma cells, we pre-treated them, and then we injected them in the flank of the mouse, and then watched them grow. We were able, so since these are malignant melanoma cells, they're pigmented, so you can actually measure them with a ruler and um, be, you're able to determine their uh, volume in this way and watch them over time. And we can see again that the microRNA 15A at 10 nanomolars and at 50, 100 nanomolars was able to uh, significantly decrease the tumor size. So this was really exciting. We also did a, a cell cycle uh, analysis. And so here we have the cell cycle reminder basically over here. We have the G1, the S to G2 to M phase. And basically, we have the G1, G0 phase represented by the blue, we have the S phase represented by the orange, and the G2 and M phase represented by the uh, gray. And here's the control, the 15A, and then the negative control. And so you can see that we had more cells in the G1, G0 phase, and less cells in the G2, M phase when we treated with the 15A. So that was... Um, kind of leading us to believe that maybe there's something about the target of microRNA 15A that helps transition from the G1 into the S phase. So we also did an invasion assay. So basically what you're looking at here is on the left we have all the cells and on the right we have only the cells that invaded. And then we look at the proportion of the cells that invaded. So here is the reagent, so again that's the control. This is the scramble and this is the 15A. And then we look at the relative invasion at, uh, index, which basically normalizes for how many cells are in the, when cells on the bottom and top are shown. And we see again that microRNA 15A is able to significantly uh, reduce the ability of the cells to invade. Uh, then we were looking more at like a mechanistic study of how, this, how 15A is working. So we use the Western blot to determine uh, protein amounts of AKT3 and uh, CDCA4. And we found that in the WM1552C and SPML28, the AKT3 and CDCA4 was decreased when we used microRNA 15A. So that led us to believe that there is at least downstream effects that is decreasing these proteins. Uh, maybe it's even directly targeting them. So we used a reporter assay, and for this we put the three prime untranslated region uh, on the three prime region of a G luciferase, and then we normalize that with an SEAP, and we do it once again without the 3' UTR, so what, that's what the empty vector is. And so without the 3' UTR and microRNA 15A, which is what this light blue is, there wasn't any significant change in the luciferase activity. However, when we did use 15A on a vector that had a target, which is the 3' UTR, we found that it significantly uh, decreased the expression suggesting that it might be a direct target. 
So here are the functions of CDCA4, which we found to be a direct target. Um, it's associated with the G1S phase transition, and it's a cell cycle transcription factor. And we've tried to do a knockdown study with this, but all the siRNA that we've used has not success successfully knocked it down. So we haven't completed that portion of the study. And if you look on uh, its gene card, there's not a lot of information associated with this protein, except for that it's associated with this um, cell cycle progression from the G1 to S phase. So this would, this would be an in interesting um, transcription factor to look more into. Um, but I was more interested in the microRNA delivery aspect of using this because there has been a slew of microRNAs that have been found to have anti-cancer effects um, in different situations. However, um, the, there's a problem with using these um, short hairpin RNA mimics. They have a, a short half-life, first of all, so it requires regular uh, treatment with these mimics, which is really expensive and inconvenient for the patient to continue having to come in uh, every few days because they really only last, uh, their half-life is about four hours. So they also require these um, cationic lipids which have a lot of cytotoxicity. They basically bind with the plasma membrane of the cell and allow a lot of different um, molecules in. Anything that is highly negatively charged, they can basically pull it through the membrane. And we see this all the time when we're using the transfection reagent. It can just completely kill the cells. So there's uh, not a big surprise that they're having a lot of immunogenic responses because of this molecule that's foreign and, and causing these problems in the cells. And so we really need to find a better uh, delivery option. Another option is you could have a plasma that's carrying the microRNA gene, but there have been problems with um, host integration mutations, and um, that's always a problem when you're using a plasmid, and I'm not sure if this is really the best answer to that. So what we've been looking at is a new method, which is using a dead caspase-9. So caspase-9 is this really cool protein that it works with um, CRISPR in bacterial cells as an immune system for the bacteria. So CRISPR is clustered regularly interspaced short uh, polydromic repeats. And these repeats basically have this gene region that is has a guide RNA that, and a tracer RNA that binds to Cas9, which is CRISPR-associated 9, and then it, it binds its target messenger RNA. Typically for the bacteria, this is going to be like a, a viral uh, RNA, and it is able to chop it up because it has a nuclease region, so it binds and its binding allows it to the endonuclease activity to, to be generated and to cut up this um, strand. However, there's a dead version, so we remove the endonuclease activity, and we can then conjugate different proteins that either have transcription repression or activation activity, and then we can go around, and it's called CRISPR interference or CRISPR activation, and we can basically modulate the uh, transcriptional activity of the nucleus. And it's this really um, fun way to use CRISPR-Cas9 without the risks that are associated with having an active endonuclease and all these off-target effects um, that is essentially going to be able to bind and chop up different regions of the DNA in the nucleus, which might um, lead to carcinogenesis. So it's like this loop of a problem. But it's great because it lasts longer than the shRNA mimics. We're able to go in there, change the transcriptional region. And this often will last like 10 days in studies, sometimes even longer. It really depends on the transcriptome environment of the cell and what other factors are present. So ACT is an adoptive cell transfer. And this is when we're able to take cells, a lot of times this is used with immune cells, and you might have heard about CAR T cells, which is a chimeric antigen receptor T cell that's specifically programmed to target a cancer cell. And this is the area of research that I'm going to be kind of moving into, actually, for my next stage of research. And this is a really promising um, area for these adoptive cell transfers because the adoptive, the cells that are being used have their own transcriptome and their own microRNAs that they're secreting in microvesicles. So if we're able to regulate the microRNAs that are present in these microvesicles, we're also able to regulate the microvesicles that are being uptaken by all the neighboring cells. And so we can use an ex vivo transfection. So we pull out the cells, we transfect the DCAS9 system in, 
has a suicide gene, so we can um, kill it if it has a problem. And um, the microRNA that we target with this dead Cas9 is able to be transferred through microvesicles, which is a natural way that cells are already uptaking and transferring microRNAs. So it's a lot more um, promising and natively used by the body um, as opposed to cationic lipids. And if we use a transient RNA to um, transfect the, the cells, then we don't have to worry about a DNA intermediate that has these problems of integrating in the host cell. So there's a lot of RNA um, viruses that we could use without their um, uh, genes that propagate the virus and just the genes that have this DCAS9 and the guide region go in, change the transcriptome environment of the cell. We have this cell that will work for like 10 to 20 days, giving out the microRNA that we want, and, and then we could repeat the cycle if it's promising, or just kill the cells with their suicide gene. So this is kind of what it looks like. We have this DCAS9 associated with either activators or depressors in the promoter region of our gene. Um, since we've had so much success with microRNA 15A, and that is one of the most promising microRNAs that I've personally seen. Uh, that's the microRNA that we're going to be looking at targeting with our DCAS9. This is its approximate region on chromosome 13. It's in like the Q14.13 region. So this is actually where we're going to be guiding this guide RNA. So this is the guide RNA that I was talking about that's found in the palindromic repeats. It binds to DCAS9 and then uses this so approximately 20 nucleotides as a guide um, to a region in the genome, and then it can bring with it its activators or repressors. So here's the plasma that we're using that has the DCAS9. Um, just to kind of show you, um, it's a pretty typical plasmid. It has ampicillin resistance, pyromycin resistance for uh, mammalian cells, ampicillin for bacterial cells. Um, it's conjugated to a BP16 uh, uh, region, which is basically an activator that's been taken out of a virus and repeated and put onto this dead Cas9. And it also has a, a green fluorescence protein. Unfortunately, it's been causing us a lot of problems. So we're currently talking with Adgene about how we can maybe have uh, better transfection rates and um, they give it to us on a bacterial stab and getting it into the cells at a, at a level that's not cytotoxic to the cells has been a problem. So we don't have um, any of the basically uh, RNA sequencing that we would like to have after using and incorporating this. However, I've been also working on developing this algorithm so that CRISPR um, A and I can be used with different microRNAs that are associated with either pro or anti-cancer effects. And this is really exciting because uh, there are about 1,800 microRNAs that are known in the human genome to have um, different gene effects. And like I was saying earlier, there's different messenger RNAs that they target. And ultimately, these messenger RNAs are making proteins. And ultimately, the conglomerate of all these things is what is going to have its effect on the cell. So I really wanted to make a platform that can be used computationally to determine whether or not different microRNAs are basically even applicable to be used for this therapy. So then we can weed out, okay, out of these 1,800 microRNAs, in this person's scenario, um, we can target these microRNAs, and this is will be what's successful, and um, start the study from this level. So basically, this is a Boolean logic algorithm that will give us uh, a lot of information on the gene and the microenvironment of the cell. And to, uh, so this will be used in a computer algorithm to basically run through a bunch of data that is, that is on the cells that are going to be used and also on their healthy cells to understand what, is, what the repercussions of using it are going to be. But it basically deals with trying to understand with 4X being the microRNA gene, is the promoter accessible? Um, how is transcription being repressed? Um, what messenger, are there messenger RNA and proteins that are associated with X that are being expressed? And based on this, we're able to determine um, whether or not microRNA will, that microRNA will have any effect. And this could be kind of a premise for deciding whether or not we're going to be using microRNA and whether it is applicable for activation or inhibition with CRISPR-I. 
And so also, uh, I'm kind of running out of time here, but just to um, kind of show where I'm going in the future with this is we're going to be looking at trying to develop precision medicine, hopefully in the Emporia community and around Kansas. And this is going to involve um, collecting samples, um, developing the informatics, which kind of goes into more algorithms that help us understand um, what micro microRNA and just micro microenvironment situations are relevant and analyzing them and then developing their personalized therapies. So here's a summary of everything that I talked about with the great aspects of uh, microRNA 15A um, and also with CRISPR A and I and the hope for precision medicine in the future. Um, I'd also like to look more at understanding how we can regulate microRNA and exosomes and ectosomes, um, understanding tumor associated antigen selection and working on some more mouse models using the ACT to understand more how we can develop that. And with that, um, I'd also like to say thank you to Kay Embry for being a phenomenal supporter of biomedical research, and thank you to my lab. And if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer. CRISPR, fascinating stuff. We've got time for maybe one quick question. Yes. So, uh, the treatment of cancer, uh, one of the big problems is the development of resistant uh, right. forms. So, do microRNAs uh, bypass that resistance, or do you have they seen resistant uh, mm -hmm. cancers develop after treatment with microRNA? Yeah, that's one of the interesting things about microRNA, I feel like, is they're a little bit more subtle than other things like the pimurafinib, where it just completely stops graft and there's like no cell growth and then the only way a cell is going to survive is if it, if, if it like remutates graft or takes another pathway. But with microRNA, since there's so many different targets and there's still, well, the sh I guess the shorter answer is the FDA is, is still undergoing, they're still in like only phase two of their clinical studies. So I think there's still a lot to understand long term in humans. Um, what it will be, but the reason I think that there's more hope in microRNA is because they have multiple targets. So, like with microRNA 15A, there's like six targets, and it's and these six targets that are all having anti-cancer effects. So it's a lot harder for the cell to have to to go or like circumvent those effects when they're when it's just being suffocated from all directions. Right. Okay. And and then maybe experimenting with combinations of microRNAs as well would be helpful to preventing that. But I'm sure there'll be, it won't be as simple as I hope that it is with my RNA. But yeah, that is a thing that we should address. So, yeah. Hello, um, as part of the independent study in piccolo pedagogy, I decided to do this project so that I could really get to understand the instrument that, and so that I can teach it to future students. Uh, so I will be talking about piccolo in the broke period, developing the piccolo, the fame system, which is what we use today, the piccolo in the orchestra, increased use of the piccolo, piccolo in concert band, and the piccolo now. So the pic piccolo in the broke went by a very different name. And it was called either the flauto piccolo or the traverso, and it referred to a completely different instrument, which we know as the recorder. Um, some famous repertoire from that period is Vivaldi's Piccolo Concerti and Telmon's Fantasias, which were first written for flute, but they are unaccompanied and they have a great range for piccolo, and so I will play just a small part of one for you. great way to, it started on the piccolo, it doesn't go too high, it doesn't go too low. Uh, so The development of the piccolo followed the flute, which the flute was more developed in 1835, and the piccolo followed suit about seven years later in 1842. The piccolo was not accepted as quickly as the flute, and there were many different systems, 40 different ways of figuring and making, creating the different notes, seven tonalities and six different materials. As you can see, I have a wooden piccolo 
that is to your right and a metal piccolo to your left. And that's just some of the materials. Um, the Bane system was created in the 1830s and keyholes were thought to be almost the exact same size. Keys should be open when not in use, including a key that is now closed today, but that, ha that development happened later. They, there was also a change from a conical bore to a cylindrical bore, and use of the Bane flute came into existence quite a lot quicker than the piccolo, and people stuck to a six-key conical piccolo. So in the orchestra, piccolo also plays an important role. It came as early as the Baroque period in the 1700s, called for either the piccolo or the recorder, depending on the key, and was mostly used in opera, such as by Rossini. And I will play an excerpt of that for you from his La Gazzaladra. So, those excerpts are a bit more challenging than the Telemann that I played earlier. Uh, they go a bit higher and they can get even faster. Um, Piccolo in the symphony, Tchaikovsky is a big writer. He wrote his symphony number two, fourth movement, and symphony number four, his third movement. In that one, the third movement is actually the first time where the piccolo comes in, and it comes in with the solo, so it is super important that the piccolo player knows just how it sounds and knows how to execute this solo correctly. Berlioz also wrote for the piccolo. He used his piccolo to introduce Faust in The Damnation of Faust, and he used a piccolo duet in Dance of the Sprites. Um, piccolo was also used by Mahler, Ravel, and Shostakovich. Shostakovich wrote a lot of great piccolo repertoire. Um, the piccolo now has more solos, it's more important, and those solos are more demanding. Piccolo in concert band, Sousa's Stars and Stripes Forever, that is the most famous solo for piccolo. And piccolo players often need to learn two different keys because there used to be a D flat piccolo, although piccolos are now in C. So parts have been reprinted, so that is involves learning a different key based on whether you're playing it with a band or orchestra. Uh, another piece of modern piccolo repertoire is Gordon Jacobs' The Pied Piper, which is two unaccompanied solos for flute and piccolo. The second movement is for piccolo. Then, to conclude, the flute and piccolo both have a long history. The piccolo is just as important and just as historic as the flute, and it is coming to its own. And now I will close out with an excerpt from the Gordon Jacob. slides there you said that there is a key that was once closed now what's, what's the story behind that um when Theobald Bain created the piccolo he believed that all keys should be open when not in use and now this th this pinky key with my left hand has since been closed I think just for acoustical purposes so hmm. so how long have you been playing uh, I got, this is actually school piccolo, and I got that piccolo about three years ago. That's when you started playing? Yeah. And what's your music history prior to? Uh, I've played some form of instrument, flute, piano, violin, since I was six. So is this your favorite uh, uh, of all flute, those? Flute and piccolo. Favorite overall? <laughs> it depends on the... I prefer piccolo in ensembles because it's okay. more of a soloistic thing, so I prefer flute for solos. Okay. Very nice. Fascinating presentation. Thank, Thank you, you very much. So, there's a lot that deals with campaign finance laws. I'm just working, focusing on corporations and other organizations and how they interact. I'm not dealing with the state level because that's a whole other mess. Or I have to do with money when they get it, um, just because that's also a whole other mess. Um, and it did not show up well. 
can't really see how well things look on your laptop, unfortunately. But the gist of this graph is that most super PAC funding and super PACs are organizations purpose to only do in, um, independent expenditures, which are advertising, and I'll talk more about those in a second. 73.8% of their money comes from individuals. Um, and a good amount actually comes from other PACs and things like that, which is always interesting. PACs are smaller. They can do a variety of things. None of these organizations are allowed to directly collude with candidates or communicate with them on their advertising expenditures or donations. They also have donation limits, which I'll cover here in a second. Super PAC, like they say, are just the super version of regular PACs. Um, they're only for independent expenditures. They have no monetary limits on amounts of their advertising. And they just they have a lot less rules. And they were made famous about a few years ago by Stephen Colbert on the national level when he ran for president in the he ran in the presidential primary in the state of South Carolina, his home state, um, using a super PAC that he got just to bring awareness to this issue and how much money goes into them. There's also social welfare organizations or nonprofits, which have become more common for entities to try to classify themselves as in recent years. They have, their primary pur purpose has to be social welfare, but Congress is, or, or the FEC has not defined what percentage or how much must go to social welfare. So you see a lot of these organizations pop up around primary time, which feels like it's all year, every year. But um, they're becoming more and more common as we see PACs kind of fade away. Types of involvement, electioneering communications. Um, like it says, 90 days before the general election and 30 days before a primary. Um, essentially, corporations and trade unions are not allowed to participate in electioneering communications. However, nonprofits and social welfare groups can. So you see a lot of, and non, the social welfare groups do not have to disclose their donors. This, this is often called dark money when you see super PACs or individuals donating large amounts of money to these nonprofits because it doesn't have to be disclosed, unlike with super PACs and PACs. Um, independent expenditures, which is the sole purpose of a super PAC, um, especially to advocate for a candidate in these advertisements. So there's, they say the magic word test, um, vote for, defeat, elect. Um, down at the bottom, which got cut off, is issue advertisements, which are geared more towards large issues and don't use the magic word test. The line is very slim between these two. Issue advertisements um, are usually what corporations, not corporations, what organizations try to fit their advertisements into um, without... They're not supposed to directly mention a candidate, but oftentimes it's very heavily implied. Like, you know, for example, pro-life, which side of the political aisle they tend to be on when it comes time for election season. And if um, nonprofits can fit their ads into this kind of a mold, and this was a huge problem in the 90s, where about 90% of issue advertisements actually mentioned candidates and failed the magic word test, and it's still an issue. The FEC lacks, you know, now we have a regulatory body, but they lack um, they lack the manpower to properly enforce a lot of things, just like the IRS and SEC, really any government agency these days. So here, uh, these are just some contribution limits. Um, individuals can 2,700 per election to a candidate, and you can see how it goes up. Um, there's soft money, which is money that is given to a party, which can then trickle down to um, the candidate. There was actually for a while, there was limits on how much money parties could give to their candidates, but that was turning down in a court case we'll talk about in a second. Um, and you can see how much PACs, a multi-candidate would typically just be like a party PAC, so a Republican PAC, or um, they're electing Republicans in the state of Kansas, something like that. Whereas non-multi-candidate candidate PACs um, have different laws and things like that. And this doesn't cover super PACs or nonprofits because they don't really have any limits which is writing. So a quick history on campaign finance law. I've tried my best to convince this down. These are all the major landmark um, laws or cases. There's obviously a lot that goes on. The first was in 1906 um, when there was this push from Teddy Roosevelt to kind of put an end to corruption, uh, corporate corruption in the policies of campaigns, you know, gangsters and whatnot. Um, and then in 1939, there was the Hatch Act, which basically gave the federal government in Congress the power to actually oversee this. So I don't really know what happened in those 30 years when they legally didn't have the power to do it. Um, but 1939 it became relevant. 
1944, our largest president gave his name to the Taft-Hardy Act, um, which essentially um, it allowed them to regulate donations, so give them a little bit more power in this sense, give themselves power. Um, but it also said that can't, you can't say how much. Oh shoot, I'm reading the next part. Um, sorry. Uh, for 1971 Federal Campaign Act, which formed the FEC, once again, um, there's three years before between the FICA, I'm going to call it, um, and the FEC was formed, and like nothing was done because they didn't have a central agency to do anything. So they just sat around and planned the FEC. Who knows? But essentially, um, 1906 and 1971. Those two laws did the same basic three things, consolidate powers, try to increase disclosure requirements, and set some sort of limits to reduce the amount of disproportionate influence that wealthy individuals and corporations have on the political campaign system. And then the first really major court case, um, which actually happened, the FEC was formed in 1974, and Buckley Blair was in 1976. It's a pretty common trend. You'll see somebody be usually the FEC every one to two years following the major law pass. Uh, but we, we Paleo said that Congress and the FEC can regulate donations. That is fully within their constitutionality. It's not a violation of free speech because they're trying to pre prevent corruption in the political system. That's usually the meter that the Supreme Court uses on their cases is, is this going to prevent corruption? Is this factor a corrupting factor in campaigns? Um, also said can't can't really tell how much a party how much they can give a candidate. It's their party. They should be able to transfer money freely, um, which essentially means you could donate 2,700 to a candidate directly, and then donate the soft money to the party, national national level and state level, and that could theoretically be funneled down into the candidate um, at the discretion of the party. Also, that there's no holds bar on personal funds. So, for example, there was a candidate who in this last election cycle spent 13 million of his own money um, on a Democratic House seat, which is insane for the House. And he still lost. You'll see that it's pretty common that people that spend a lot of their own money don't necessarily um, always do well. Um, more recently, the McCain-Feingold Act, which is the bipartisan campaign reform, uh, which is still, still talked about. We want to repeal it, we want to do all this. Um, target soft money and electionary communication financing, essentially saying that corporations and trade unions cannot participate in electionary communications, but they can participate in other kind of communications, and they can do these communications. Um, these specific, electionary communications are just for candidates, you know, elect to feet. They can do them before the time periods. Um, and, and soft money, trying to limit the donations on soft money to parties. Also, it was a bipartisan effort. I think that's important to say, and this isn't an issue that's one side of the aisle. It's Democrats and Republicans alike both take a large amount of money from corporations and various organizations. Um, following this, there was actually two court cases. This law got extra lucky. Um, Beaumont said nonprofits can donate, and nonprofits do not have to have the same disclosure laws that corporations do, because this actually became relevant even earlier in the 60s and 70s with the NAACP where disclosing their donors might put their donors at risk. Um, McConnell upheld um, the McCain-Feingold Act, but it did find, and it did find that um, restricting soft money was allowed. It did not impair free speech due to the whole corruption thing. However, it was a very device, uh, divisive court case in that the, there was a 1668 and 25 page opinions <laughs> written on it with an appendix for each one, followed by three different judges which was like a mix of dissenting and agreeing on some things that I can't imagine writing 68 pages about anything. So I must have felt very strongly. The 68 page one was actually from George Kennedy. Um, I think that's interesting. So it says United, which is its own slide, because it kind of changed our current um, landscape. Essentially, that restricting infringement rights for nonprofits was a violation of their free speech. And then this same logic was later extended to corporations and other um, types of organizations like unions, and this is for political speech, for advertisements, not for their donations like I, I showed you earlier, this is for their political speech, that is a form of free speech that we as individuals have because we can spend as much money as we want on advertisements ourselves, but so should nonprofits. Um, you know, it's advertising not done with the candidates, so obviously it's about a candidate, but it's not done with their party, but there's ways you can get around that, and that includes fundraisers where the candidate's there, but they're not there, and they're 
office does and doesn't know about it. And we've been dealing with that lately in our most recent administration about what's colluding and what's not. And it's kind of a very fuzzy line. Um, yeah, and upheld the requirement for public disclosure, which is really important, but how many people actually look at it? Um, you'll see it's really common where um, it'll be Americans for clean air. It'll be three guys in Idaho and things like that. Um, so disclosure is important, but most Americans don't look at it. And also said that you have to say at the end of an asset price event who they're sponsored for, for um, express advocacy, advocacy ads and independent expenditures, but not with issue ads. Uh, which is one of the reasons that, because issue ads that don't say who they're sponsored by tend to actually do better than um, the express advocacy and electionary communications in terms of public response. So where does that leave us? Uh, the average Senate seat in 2016 cost $9.6 million, which is insane. 47% um, of that was funded by outside organizations like PACs, corporations, nonprofits. Um, and in its independent expenditures or advertisements, 0.01% of the population, which is about 31,000 people, um, funded about a third of them. <laughs> like I said, there's, you'll see PACs and it's actually like three people. Um, and actually one of the largest um, super PACs was the Act Blue in the 2016, which was a Democratic coalition. Usually you can tell the difference because uh, Republican coalitions usually have America somewhere in there. <laughs> um, I'm not even kidding. It's true. Um, in, in 2016, in 30 different House congressional races, outside parties spent more than both candidates, which is absolutely insane. Um, so, and these, they're getting more and more expensive. It hasn't always been this way, and I'll cover those numbers in a minute. Um, most of the money goes to incumbents. Our incumbency rate in the House is a, has been above 80%, and usually just getting we're close to that. The Senate is different because during the Nixon era, you saw a really sharp um, decline in incumbency rates. With, there was just enough people. I don't know why it didn't translate to this to the House as well. Maybe it's the two-year terms, but and Senate seats are historically way more expensive because it's for six-year terms versus the House for two. Um, I think the average House race was about two million, which is still a lot of money. Um, but yeah, uh, candidates can self-raise, and so Trump, 20% of his nearly 40 million was self-funded. And then this is a candidate I was speaking about earlier. His entire $13 million campaign came from his own pocket, which is still crazy to me. And then the most expensive house seat actually cost $27 million, and it was in Florida District 18. And so for Senate seats, you're like, yeah, those are expensive. You have to cover an entire state. The house seats, especially in large areas, large states cover smaller areas. Um, also, yeah, it was $18 million by the candidate, and it was won by Randy Perkins, which I've never heard. Paul Ryan actually raised a record about this last year, but um, most of it went to other PACs and organizations. You're allowed to spend PAC money and send it to other PACs, which is, once again, a whole other thing. Um, you'll see that a lot. People that are in safe races, and they know they're going to win, like Paul Ryan or John McCain, they're going to raise lots of money still from their donors, who maybe have already donated to this other PAC organization, and then they'll just they'll just move money around. And it's kind of scary. Um, and it hasn't always been this way. So presidents, especially, and congressional candidates have to spend a lot more time during their term fundraising, which is really hard when you're not with your constituents. But this is just the number of fundraisers, and it's just gone up and up and up and up because they don't have a choice. Uh, you're, I mean, your opponent from the day you're elected is already getting ready to run against you in four years or sooner. Um, and obviously this, you know, if you look at the numbers, you can be like, oh, well, they go down. Well, they go down when it's the second term because you already have that name recognition. But it's just gotten worse over the years. And obviously Obama was very handily elected by the public and he still had this issue um, where he, which is crazy. You want, and it's the same thing for congressional candidates. There's been more time doing call centers and fundraisers there's entire documentaries out there about how congressional candidates, you know, especially new ones, sitting in little rooms and cubicles, calling people, trying to fundraise. And it's really just because we want our congressmen and our president to be working, not having to worry about fundraising. Um, and part of that is the raising costs, and part of that is also party pressure. So um, outside spending with no disclosure of donors, this just basically shows the increase in these nonprofit social welfare groups that don't have to um, disclose their donors. More and more organizations are moving towards us for obvious secrecy reasons. Um, just because 
we already we kind of assume that billionaires play a large role in millionaires in the election process and people would argue they do they don't um, they always go like for example Jeb Bush still lost so obviously they don't but you know it depends on your viewpoint and how you see this whether this is a good or a bad thing printing confidentially and protecting free speech but you can't dispute that it has gone up and we're seeing less and less um, hacks and also less um, presentations, less advertisements classified as um, commu electionary communications and issue ads and more as independent expenditures. Also, there's more money being moved around and this is kind of what I, just what I talked about. So obviously it's just gone up over the years and 2014 was um, midterms. So it's going to be a little bit lower. But I mean, it's insane how much is being spent. So, yeah, it's just crazy high to me um, how much money we spend on various things. Um, you can see how it's being moved around. I mean, in 2016, it was everywhere all the time. We also had two very divisive candidates. I think that's important to put these numbers in perspective. And these are adjusted for inflation, all the numbers are. Because I hate when people say, oh, well, we have the issue with the state of Kansas. Oh, we're putting more money into education. Well, actually, you're not. You adjust it. But so all these are adjusted, and you can kind of see where, where we had some really um, divisive candidates for 2004, Bush v. Gore, um, 2016, Trump v. Clinton. And you always tend to see things go up when there's less neutral candidates, which is becoming more and more common. Um, people are becoming more and more bipartisan, not bipartisan. Also, elections are just getting more expensive, <laughs> which is crazy. Um, this is the total span of congressional and presidential races. So you just see how this kind of eliminates the ability for a dark horse or independent candidate to get involved in the election cycle or somebody who doesn't have the support of large groups. If you don't have the support of various unions or corporations or organizations or PACs or super PACs, your odds are slim to none unless you have a lot of your own money. And those candidates tend to lose because they don't have other organizations who are also working for them and doing and helping with those advertisements or organizing outside fundraisers and expanding the circle. So, yeah, I mean, it's gotten worse over the years, and Citizen United and all these court cases, this kind of like, we saw an uptick, especially during the Nixon era, of disclosure and being honest, and then recent years it's been about free speech and corporations and their abilities. And I think that there's been pushes lately for change in this, especially on the Democratic side and with Bernie Sanders, who um, Sunlight Foundation Open Secrets are devoted to kind of exposing what goes on, and everything that's happening in our election cycle. Sunlight Foundation is, they focus more on showing things open secrets, more focused on aggregating data. The FEC has a ton of data. And how many of you are gonna sit there and read the 128 page 2016 congressional report of disclosures? Also, both sides push for more disclosure. Um, I think that's really interesting to see that both sides want to know who's funding their opponents. That's one of the few things, because most of these laws aren't going to be changed because they benefit the people that we currently have in office. And I would not see those change. But with both sides push, for pushing for more disclosure and reduced secrecy, that might be a change that's actually feasible. Um, more funding and resources for the FEC, which isn't likely to happen, but it's been a push where you can't regulate with like, six people in a cubicle somewhere, essentially. Because my dream job would be do campaign finance law, but there are no jobs in it. Um, also, limited party contributions and funding. They're, um, on the Republican side, they say that this is choking down free speech. And if we allowed for um, people to donate as much and spend as much on parties as uh, other organizations do on advertisements, then this would balance out some of the issues. Also, limiting super PAC donation amounts, like so no longer unlimited. And also limiting the amount of money going between PACs. So yeah, that is it. Any questions? I only have one, and, and that's whether or not you think that there's been any change uh, regarding campaign financing when it comes to social media use. I don't see that. If the idea is we've spent billions on television advertisements and radios and staff doing call center type of activities, has that changed with social media? Um, I think it's provided a new outlet with electioneering communications and the McCain-Feingold Act. It said you can't do broadcasting. So no television or radio, but nothing about print. And so they could do promoted things, but um, my generation isn't very politically active. And we're the ones mainly on these forms of social media. So... It hasn't hit yet. 
on that? Yeah, I mean, I think after this most recent election, you're seeing a push for more involvement. And, but I don't think, I mean, one of Bernie Sanders' main things was $27 from the average person. So I think from that aspect, there's awareness on that end of it, about how much good the common people can do in grassroots, like we saw with Obama. But on the other end of it, there's not a lot of, I mean, you see it more with laws and people already in Congress, like with the ISP debate, and now with net neutrality of, oh, who's lobbying money? I think lobbying money is becoming a very big pointy issue, but not so much campaign. My name is Megan George, and I did a research study comparing the heart rate recovery times among untrained individuals, trained individuals, recreationally trained, and athletically trained individuals at the college level, college age level. And the heart rate is responsive to stresses that are placed on the body. It depends um, on a lot of different things. It can be physical stress, it can be mental stress, it can be emotional stress. Um, in this research day, I tested the physical stresses. Um, so whatever the demands that is placed on the body, the heart rate will um, it'll respond appropriately, either increasing or decreasing. Um, once again, increased in this study. But once the activity has stopped, the desire for it has stopped, the energy levels are kind of even back out, they will go to a lower resting response. Um, and the time that it takes for the heart rate to recover is known as a heart rate recovery time, for it to go back to the resting level that was measured at beforehand. Um, it's also used as an indicator for cardiovascular fitness assessments, such as the Bruce, the Maximal treadmill test, the bulky um, step test, all sorts of different assessments that professionals use in the health and fitness organizations. So the tip, typically the shorter um, heart rate recovery time, um, the more aerobically fit the individual, individual is. Um, this has been shown in different studies, other studies, um, and we went ahead and tested it again for um, young college age athletes and non-athletes. There's less um, research on that. So the purpose of it, of this day, was to examine the heart rate recovery times among college students and kind of group them into their physical levels and compare each group. So participants, there were 21 total participants, seven in each group, untrained, recreationally trained, and athletically trained. Um, we have about an even amount, as even as you could be for 21, male and female, um, untrained. They did not do any kind of regular aerobic training or cardiovascular training. Um, the baseline that we used here was the 150 minutes that the ACSM recommends um, of aerobic activity a week. If they were recreationally trained, they were college students who were not participating in a sport or athletic, and they got at least that 150 minutes of aerobic training that the ACSM recommends, which is the American College of Sports Medicine. And the athletically trained um, group were specifically cross country athletes here at Emporia State. The methods that we used um, prior to exercise, I met with each individual who would be partaking, who volunteered for the study. And I recorded their heart rate, did informed consent, all the paperwork needed prior to doing that. And I explained the test to them, what was going to happen. I took their heart rate with a pulse oximeter, and then I backed that up with a manual reading as well. And the exercise session consisted of walking and jogging um, on treadmill, and it was the Bruce submaximal test. So the incline changed and the speed changed every three minutes um, until 70% of their calculated heart rate max was reached. And then they were told, they're instructed to hold this intensity performance to keep their heart rate about that level plus or minus five, six beats a minute. So after the um, submaximal test was 
finish once I hit that 70% heart rate peak that they needed to, they immediately went into a resting recovery where they were instructed to sit down, um, both feet while on the floor, and not talk, um, just to kind of get an accurate reading. Once again, I used the pulse oximeter, and I used manual readings every minute. And it was determined from the cessation of the test until they reached their resting heart rate that we took prior to that test. So these are some of the results. Um, as you can see, you can kind of see the breakdown there. Um, gender, the age, body mass, and then their resting heart rate and their overall average heart rate and um, recovery time. And as you can see, the untrained and recreationally trained are vastly different in how fast that those individuals recovered on average. And same with recreationally trained and athletically trained. Each group is distinctively different from the other as far as how fast their heart rate recovery was. So we did a one-way ANOVA using the heart rate recovery time of the three groups. And the Bonferroni post hoc test revealed that the athletically trained group had a shorter recovery time than the other two, the recreationally trained and the untrained group, as seen in the previous chart. And then this is just in that chart form, a bar graph where you can see the significance of each level and how each level really does vary. So in conclusion, the athletically trained group individuals had a shorter heart rate recovery time than the untrained individuals and the recreationally trained individuals, and it was a significant amount. Um, recreationally trained students have a longer heart rate recovery time than the athletically trained individuals, and but a shorter time than the untrained individuals. And this data is supported through some literature that has been published prior that with the more training you have, with the more aerobic exercise that you receive a week, um, you will be more cardiovascularly fit. And the duration of your heart rate recovery time can be a significant um, indicator of cardiovascular health. It is not the only thing that is an indicator for cardiovascular health, but it is one of the main things that we use in the health and fitness profession. And also the heart rate recovery time is inversely proportional to cardiovascular fitness. So as the heart rate recovery time increases, the cardiovascular fitness decreases. And typically aerobic exercise may play a role in the cardiovascular health and well-being of individuals. Are there any questions? Questions? I just had a comment. Yeah. Um, this is very interesting. It's kind of what you probably would have predicted, but it would have been neat to see the correlation between the amount of time it took for someone to reach that 70%. I'm assuming those that recovered faster take a longer time to get to the 70% of their physical exertion. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. It happened. Um, I actually walked out 30 minutes for the athletically trained individuals, and it happened to take longer than that just to get them to up to that M70% peak and back down mm -hmm. overall. So it was just a longer walk of time. So. Any other questions? Yes. So did you <clears throat> determine differences between the recreational athletes, the recreational trained and the athletes in terms of what their, what their weekly in intensity workouts were? I, I know that the cutoff was 150, but it seems like you could have recreational trained people that could go as much or more than cross country runners in some cases. I'm just curious what the overall difference was between those two groups. Yeah, so um, I actually did not have a cap for those recreationally trained people. I didn't have 150 to 300 minutes a week. Um, but we do have, there is evidence that the, like, these kids are obviously recruited to run cross country and they were all 
um, form all levels of grades as far as freshmen to seniors. And our recreationally trained athletes happen to be more juniors and seniors. So that was probably the closest that I could get to a real comparison of them. I know that some of our recreationally trained um, individuals were also um, weightlifters and they did other stuff on the side of it. So I don't think their main focus was aerobic exercise, whereas cross country is their main workout. So. Would the results be different if the athletically trained weren't cross country runners, but if they were your your sprinters and those that aren't used to the long distance running and the throwers? Huh? <laughs> throwers. I don't know. I'm just I would have assuming that a sprinter would we're out faster on a treadmill than a cross country runner. Maybe not. Yeah, um, I believe those results would have been different. Mm -hmm. um, just because what you're training for, it can be anywhere from power to speed um, to endurance. There's multiple things that you can train for. And so I think having the endurance runners, because that strengthens their heart a little bit better, in my opinion, than sprinters or throwers who focus on power and power output and they're more focused on that muscle mass that they're trying to gain. Mm -hmm. so. We've got a question. Okay. So can you go back to go back to that graph possibly? Or graph. Okay. So the uh, so the, the, the athletes take about a little about, about two minutes or so, uh, about three minutes or so for the recreationally trained. Uh, so in terms of heart health is that difference gonna make that big of an impact? Is it good enough to be recreationally trained as far as health goes? Or does being an athlete provide even more heart health, extra protection, so to speak, from cardiovascular disease? Is there a break point between those? There is, um, there is, so aerobic exercise is good for you up to a certain point, and then at that point it becomes detrimental the more you do. So um, that's kind of like a fine line right now that a lot of coaches, um, ACSM people are kind of walking as far as, um, I can't even think of the word right now, but I think, I believe it's cardio myopathy hypertrophy. I don't know. Okay, well, there becomes the point where the heart will get so big in muscle mass because you've trained it and that can actually be detrimental and that can cause a lot of issues as well. So I believe that just because you're not an athlete, you can still experience the a similar set of benefits. It may not be the exact same as an athletically trained individual, but I do believe a recreationally trained individual can experience very, very similar. So are you saying the athletes are actually at risk for Heart problems? Potentially, potentially it really? depends on um, how much training they really do get a week and what they do outside of that training. If they do extra, it can really impact. Um, based on your data? Based on my data, that and no. I believe our athletes that we use for this would not be at risk. 